My Lords, I speak to introduce this two amendment group and will be speaking to 286 in my name. My noble friend, Baroness Jones of Molskorn following will speak to 288 and you can take it as read that I'm entirely behind that as well. Now I make no apologies for referring again to the New Zealand Living Standards Framework, which is guiding every decision of that nation's treasury. That's truly world leading and this amendment seeks to take us a long way towards catching up. The amendment might be taken as a continuation of my efforts to help the noble Lord the Minister convince the Treasury that it is operating on flawed assumptions. The Treasury currently acts as though it is there in the interests of that entirely artificial, thoroughly discriminatory and deeply flawed, flawed construct, the economy, rather than operating for the well-being and security of people and planet. This amendment would provide a legal framework for change. It's essentially the same amendment that was tabled in the other place by Green MP Caroline Lucas, where it attracted cross-party backing. Now, this morning I was at an international event talking about how the people are leading on climate and biodiversity crises, with businesses and governments trailing behind. And our long slog on this environment bill, a reflection, as my noble friend said in the last session, of the way the government has failed to provide the necessary steel in its contents fit for this desperately late year of 2021 means its timing is fortuitous. For today, a report was released by the Institute for Public Policy Research, drawing, drawing on the views of citizen panels in the South Wales Valleys, Essex, Aberdeenshire and Tees Valley and County Durham, all of which offered their views on how the country should reach net zero 2050 by a series of panels held over 18 months. I go to the agreed conclusions of the Tees Valley and County Durham panel, quote, action to address the accelerating climate and nature emergencies can be about more than staving off the worst. It can be about imagining a better world which we can build together, a future where people and nature thrive with resilient local communities, good jobs, successful low carbon businesses, and where inequalities are reduced and opportunities offered to all. A future where progress is measured, my emphasis, by the quality of life, security and well-being of all citizens, as well as the health of our natural world. End quote. What this is talking about is reprogramming the economy. In practical terms, in the IPPD report, there are more than 100 recommendations, ranging from upgrades to local public transport and policies to make it free by 2030, with free bus travel by 2025 as a first step. It also calls on the government to launch a huge annual green housing scheme, similar to its flagship Help to Buy, to help people replace their gas boilers with green alternatives and make energy efficiency improvements. It urges ministers to introduce a right to retrain scheme for a just transition. So it's deeply disappointing that today we heard then that the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy is rejecting calls to include a VAT cut for green home improvements, the kind of thing that this amendment would surely point towards. Um, uh, this is in the context where our buildings continue to account for 14% of our carbon emissions and we're seeing precious little sign of progress. In a letter seen by The Guardian, the Treasury Minister said the government had no plans to change the VAT treatment because this would still not bridge the get price gap with gas boilers. Now, no one is saying that this should be the only measure, but it's certainly a no-brainer of one. So turning directly back to the amendment, part three consists of a long list of the environmental impacts to be considered. In short, it covers the planetary boundaries that we're already exceeding or at risk of exceeding, or frighteningly in some cases still don't know where we are, but know we're at risk. I draw attention particularly to um, subpart eight about nitrogen flows where we are, on one calculation at least, most exceeding those planetary limits as a nation, needing to reduce them by 89%. Those, that, of course, is of intimate concern to this environment bill, being wrapped up in artificial fertiliser use, factory farming, soil erosion and the management of sewerage. Phosphorus, on 85%, is only marginally less bad and tied with many of the same issues. Now, part four of this amendment addresses the need for new goals, new vision and indicators, something New Zealand has already done. But to put it directly in our terms, it makes clear of the need 
uh, to use these in the central government guidance on appraisal and evaluation produced by the Treasury, otherwise known as the Green Book. Now, you don't have to rely on the people to identify the need for this amendment. In a recent report for the OECD, a group of leading economists warned that pattern of economic growth are now generating significant harms, including, quote, rising inequality and catastrophic environmental degradation, close quote. The report calls for a paradigm shift in the way rich countries approach economic policy. So instead of focusing on GDP, they prioritise sustainability, human well-being, inequality reduction, and strengthening economic resilience. They go on to call for a new metric like gross ecosystem product to enable countries to go beyond GDP and in integrate the value of nature into all decision making. Now, noble lords can of course read for themselves the details of the amendment, but I will just draw attention to one final element of it. And that's in part 5B, it says in drawing up the strategy, the government must obtain, publish, and take into account the advice of, quote, a nationally representative citizens assembly. My lords, if the government wants to be world leading, or at least in the front of the pack, then this method of direct deliberative democracy, of engaging the people in this dreadfully urgent task of tackling the climate emergency, nature crisis, and all the pressing environmental and social issues we face, then there it is. It has a proven pedigree internationally. Look at the progress in Ireland on gay marriage and abortion law. Look at the experiments run here on local issues in England. Look at our National Climate Assembly and look to the examples with which I began this speech. My Lords, I have no doubt the UK will eventually get to implementing a system something very like this amendment proposes. But we cannot wait. We need it now. I thank all the other noble Lords who are taking part in this debate and I look forward to the Minister's response. Thank you, my Lords.